Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Alabaster. Such a joy today to begin our service with baptism. Our first candidate is Caitlin Gibson. This is Caitlin Gibson. Caitlin, what is your confession? Caitlin, upon your confession that Jesus is Lord, your willingness to follow him in obedience and baptism, it's my privilege to baptize you, my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is May Bridges. May, what is your confession? May, upon your confession that Jesus is Lord and upon your willingness to follow him in obedience and baptism, it's my privilege to baptize you, my sister in Christ. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. service for baptism. Let's continue uh, that theme of excitement this morning. Would you stand together, lift your voices with us. Praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Let's worship together this morning. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and the salvation.
from his people again gladly forever adore him. Amen. Let's continue to lift praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning when we have gathered to worship him and him alone. Would you sing with us, brethren? verse together this morning. Let us love our God supremely. Would you sing with us? Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Thank you so much, church. We're glad you're here. You can have a seat. Good morning and happy Father's Day. For our scripture reading this morning, we want to read a passage that challenges us and guides us as fathers. Psalm 112, verses 1 and 2 says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord and greatly delights in his commands. For his children will be mighty in the land and the generation of the upright will be blessed. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we do bow in your presence 
to worship you, to acknowledge that you are the one true living God. And on this special day, Father's Day, we do pause and we thank you for our fathers and the influence they were on our life. Those of us who are fathers, Lord, we, we thank you for this incredible privilege and the awesome blessing to be entrusted with the responsibility of caring for a child. Lord, I pray that you would equip us, that you would challenge us, that you would lead us to inspire our children, to influence our children for the things of God. Lord, it is humbling yet insightful that of all the ways you could have chosen to reveal yourself to your creation, you chose the image of a father, communicating once again the incredible responsibility and privilege it is to be called a father. As our Heavenly Father, you are the one who cares for us, you are the one who provides, you are the one who protects. I pray that we as earthly fathers would do the same for our families, that we would lead, that we would guide, that we would protect, and that we would provide. I pray that you would equip us today as we gather here and consider the subject of being a godly father and walking with God, that you would use the message in such a way to help us fulfill that responsibility. We ask now your blessing upon this service. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Again, happy Father's Day, and thank you so very much for choosing to worship with us today. As far as announcements, we don't have a lot of announcements to share with you, except that we have a big need for some additional host homes for our Vacation Bible School. Uh, our Vacation Bible School is going to be a little bit different this year. We're not hosting it on campus. We're going to be doing it in various neighborhoods, often referred to as backyard Bible clubs. That can be a little misleading. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the backyard, but uh, we are hosting it in, the, in neighborhoods. We have 10 host homes that have signed up now, and I think we have some who would be interested in doing it, but maybe they don't feel like they can teach uh, that uh, lesson or lead the Vacation Bible School. We want you to know that we have uh, an army of volunteers who are willing to serve and to lead and teach and conduct the Bible School. We just need some locations to host uh, the Vacation Bible School. So if you are willing to be one of those host homes, please let uh, Amber Benefield know, let Michael McVeigh know, contact the church office that you'd be willing to do that and we can get a team of volunteers to help conduct that Bible school at your home. Again, thank you so very much for choosing to worship with us today. We're looking forward to the Lord doing some amazing things. Let's continue to worship together this morning. Would you stand to your feet as we lift high the name of Jesus together? God is the lion, he is the lamb. Let's sing to him this morning. He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God. sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, oh, every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, open up the gates, make a way before the king. God who 
comes to save, he's here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, and he's hiding the battles, and every knee will bow. together who can stop the Lord Almighty. Would you lift your voice with us as we continue to sing together? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord Put our voices together. Our God is the lion. Our God is the lion. The lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. And he's fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb. The lamb that will slay. For the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Amen. He is the lion of Judah, and he's fighting our battles, and he's already fought the fight, and he's won the war. And because of that, we can say he is our way maker, our miracle worker, our promise keeper. And he's our light in the darkness. Would you continue to worship with us this morning? You are here. He's moving in our midst. Let's sing together. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, you're working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are. Miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're healing every I worship you, I worship you, and you are here, turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, and you are here, Lord, you're mending every heart, I worship you. Right in the darkness, my God. 
darkness my God that is who you are say it again you are way maker way maker miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my God that is who you are even when we don't see it even when I don't see it your work even when I don't feel it your work yeah. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it. time this morning you are way maker miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my God that is who you are would you pray with us that is who you are you are a way maker our miracle worker our promise keeper and our light in the darkness we thank you that you made a way when there was no way. There was no way for us to be able to spend eternity with you without the sending of your son, without the sacrifice that you gave for us on the cross, making a way for us to be able to have the opportunity to spend eternity with you in the place that you've gone to prepare for us. And we thank you for the sin debt that you repaid on our behalf that we could in no way ever think about beginning to repay when you paid it for us in full Father we thank you for that this morning for making a way when there was none Lord, as we continue through this time of worship it's our prayer that you would use each and every aspect of it to draw us into your presence and to move in us and to move through us as we've gathered here this morning if there's any distractions in this place right now, Lord, I pray that you would rid, the, rid them from this room, from this tent. Lord, allowing, allow, allowing the moving of your spirit to take full reign throughout the remaining time that we have together today. Lord, in just a moment as Pastor Steve comes to deliver the message you placed upon his heart, it's our prayer that you'd use him mightily as an instrument of your glory to lift high the name of Jesus, but to proclaim the truth of the gospel. 
God, I pray that it would not fall upon deaf ears this morning, but as a congregation, may we be open and receptive to the message that you've given him. May we be open and receptive to the moving of your spirit. Lord, we give you this time and ask that your will be done above all else. Move in us, move through us. Use this time of worship as you see fit. God, we love you. We ask these things in the holy and strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, church. You can have a seat. Let me encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 5 as we look at a subject today describing a great walk. Throughout biblical history, there have been numerous walks of historical significance. The Bible describes that Abraham left his home and walked to a city not made with human hands. Moses led the nation of Israel on a walk out of Egyptian slavery, slavery across the Red Sea. Joshua would extend that walk as he led them across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus walked on water and even called Peter to walk on the water with him. In recent years, there's been a fascination with the advance of wearable technology where People keep up with the number of steps that they take on a given day. But far greater than the quantity of steps that you take is the quality of steps that you take walking with God. If you have your Bibles, look with me in Genesis chapter 5. As we look at the story of Enoch, Genesis chapter 5, I'll begin reading in verse 21. I'll be reading out of the NIV translation. The Word of God says, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. Let's pray. Almighty God, it is in the name of Jesus that we bow in your presence as we come now to the preaching of your word. I pray that you would anoint me as your messenger this morning, that my message not be with just wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power that men's faith rests not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of Almighty God. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Today I claim your promise that your word is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. That your word is like the rain and the snow which does not go forth without accomplishing your purpose. That your word, as the prophet Jeremiah declared, is like a hammer that shatters a rock to pieces. Your word is like a fire that burns in a man's soul. Today I claim the promise that Jesus is the word of God. So it is my prayer that you would open the eyes of our heart that we might see and respond to the Lord Jesus. I ask this in his holy and strong name. Amen. The Bible has very little to say about Enoch, but what it does say is extraordinary. He was a man who pleased God to the extent that when it came time for Enoch to die, that he did not suffer death, God miraculously and supernaturally called him straight to heaven. We only read about Enoch in three brief references in the Bible. The passage we just read here in Genesis chapter 5. There's a brief passage in Hebrews chapter 11 describing some of the heroes of the faith. And then we have a two reference or two verse reference in the book of Jude. In Genesis, we're told that Enoch walked with God. He had only one claim to fame. He didn't part the Red Sea like Moses. He didn't wrestle with God like Jacob. He never killed a giant like David did. He didn't walk on water like Jesus and Peter, but he did walk with God. Those four words place him in the hall of fame described here in the hall of faith of Hebrews chapter 11 with this commentary. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him. He obtained a witness 
that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. On this Father's Day, I want us to examine the life of this man who walked with God. I want us to see the point of conversion in his life, this path of communion with God, and finally, a proclamation for us to consider. We've already noted that Enoch walked with God, but I want you to notice what it says in verse 22. It says that after his son was born, Enoch began to walk faithfully with the Lord. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of information about what his life was like before he had a son, except to say that before his son was born, he did not walk with God, but after his son was born, he began to walk with God. Enoch had a conversion experience, a before-after experience that changed his life. Becoming a dad marked a significant difference in his life. The change was more than just losing a little sleep with a newborn child. The change was more than being inconvenienced of changing diapers or the frustration of having to attach a car seat to a camel. I don't know if you've ever attached a car seat recently. I got four kids, and so we had used car seats as they were young and growing up, and it wasn't that big a deal. You would just kind of pull the seat belt through the various slots in the car seat and buckle it up. But then they advanced to something called the clip. I don't know if you remember the clip. You would just clip the two parts of the belt, and you'd run that through the back of it. But now you have to be an Olympic gymnast to install a car seat. My father-in-law used to say that the people who flunked out of engineering school, he was the former launch director of the space shuttle, but he said those that flunked in engineering are the ones that design toys and the instructions on how to assemble them. I'm convinced now that flunked engineers have designed car seats. You know, if you've installed one of these lately, you have to slide your hand with a spring clip between the seat, between the back of the seat and the, the actual seat cushion, so you have to Put your hand as if it was a pancake under the seat and manipulate a spring clip. And then you have another strap that goes over the back requiring a back flip and a half twist in order to hook the thing in the back. Every time I have to install one of those when we carry our grandkids, I'm reminded that I am a sinner saved by grace because it frustrates me to install those things. And I don't know what it was about having a child, but when Enoch had this child, there was something that resonated in him that said, I am going to live my life differently. I vividly recall when my first child was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and I held my daughter for the first time. In this overwhelming, almost indescribable sensation of this is really important. <laughs> you know? I have to be responsible for the life of another person. I have been entrusted with this responsibility. The scripture that we read for our scripture reading this morning was taken from Psalm one. 12 verses 1 and 2, blessed is the man who fears the Lord and greatly delights in his command for his children will be mighty in the land and the generation of the upright will be blessed. And when Enoch holds Methuselah for the first time, he's overwhelmed with this desire that God has entrusted this child to me. And from this day forward, I am going to live my life in such a way that I will set an example for this child. I'm going to live for God so that my son would be mighty in the land, that God would bless my child. I'm going to live my life differently. Becoming a father changed Enoch's desire. His conversion experience is similar to some of the other transformational moments in Scripture. You may recall the moment that changed Moses' life. It's described for us in Exodus chapter 3. It begins with these words. One day Moses was tending flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock into the wilderness or into the desert, and he came to Sinai, the mountain of God. It was there where he sees the burning bush. But the phrase that I want you to understand is the Scripture opens with these words. One day, while he was tending sheep, he did that for 40 years. For 14,600 days, the sun rose and the sheep grazed. But on day 14,601, his life changed forever when he had an encounter with God and God spoke to him on the burning bush. One day, 
A woman encountered Jesus at Jacob's well, and her life was forever changed. One day, Zacchaeus decided that he wanted to get a better look of Jesus as he came into the village, and he climbed a tree, never expecting Jesus to say, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. One day, Saul of Tarsus was going down the road to Damascus, and he saw a light brighter than the noonday sun, and he heard the Lord Jesus call out his name, and his life was forever changed. How long does it take God to change a life? How long does it take God to restore a marriage? How long does it take God to call the prodigal home? How long does it take for a person to find peace and purpose in their life? How long does it take God to save a soul? It takes one day when his grace, his glory, his power changes us. There was a point of conversion. When his son was born, Enoch said, my life will be different from this day forward. But not only do we see this point of conversion, notice the path of communion. He has this before-after transformational moment in his life, but it leads him on this path of communion with God. Walking with God is a beautiful way to describe faith, but it may be a little vague, and so I think it's helpful to identify some of the characteristics of what does it mean to walk with God. First, I want you to notice the possibility. At the risk of overstating the obvious, we need to learn that walking with God is possible. I think there's some who believe that this is something that's unattainable, but you really can't walk with God, that somehow walking with God is reserved for the luminaries of the faith. It's reserved for those people's names who are listed in the chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, these incredible saints, these heroes who lived with God, that somehow they possessed some type of special ability to to relate with God. But even when you read through that chapter and it describes name after name of these great heroes of the faith, it'll say, and then there were many others. Most of us would throw ourselves in that camp. The others that desire to follow God. Some of you have heard the phrase, a personal relationship with Christ. And maybe you've heard that phrase all your life and somehow it's become uh, commonplace. And we forget how radical that concept is in the whole realm of religious experiences. Most religions have some type of standardization, a set of rules that you have to adhere to in order to experience the blessing of whatever deity you want to please. But the Bible says that we were enemies of God, but because of the work of Christ, we've now been reconciled to the extent that we have a Savior. And not only do we have a Savior, but that Savior calls us his friend. Jesus said, I don't call you servants. I don't call you slaves. But I call you my friend. The story of Enoch walking with God illustrates for us that this walk is not something that's reserved for those that are just vocational ministers or the heroes of the faith, but it is an invitation to all who would seek to follow the Lord. Not only do we see the possibility, but walking with God communicates a partnership The Old Testament book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 3, asks this question, can two walk together unless they are agreed? And the answer to the question is, no, they cannot, that it requires agreement for you to walk in fellowship with someone. To walk with God means that you agree with God, that you come to a point in your life where you say, I'm not going to live my life by opinion anymore. We live in a culture where it seems like if you can... uh, place something on Twitter or you can place something online, you can state your opinion as if everybody's opinion has value. But when you become a follower of Christ, you no longer live by personal opinion, but you live by the personal conviction that what God says is right and true. You embrace what God says about life and faith. You stop living by opinion and live by conviction according to the word of God. The apostle John said it this way. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And this we know the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin. Included in this concept of having a partnership with God is living to please him instead of trying to please the world. When the apostle Paul described his ministry in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, 
He said, we have been entrusted with the gospel, therefore we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our heart. He would write in the book of Romans, I'm not going to live my life conformed to the world, but I'm going to be transformed by the power of Christ. He understood that his life was to be different. The Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways. His ways are holy. And so when we live a life that is pleasing, as it describes Enoch did, in Hebrews chapter 11, he was commended as one who pleased God. It means that you walk in partnership with an understanding that it's your calling now to bring glory and honor to his name instead of seeking the approval of the world. The New Testament book of James contains this warning. It says anybody who is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Now that doesn't mean that there's nothing in the world that you enjoy. It's just a, a calling and attention to the fact that when you place such a premium on trying to get the affection of the world that you will miss the opportunity to honor God. It says of Enoch, he lived his life to please God. He walked in partnership with God. He agreed with him. But not only do we see the partnership, but notice the progression. When you use the term walk, you're communicating that you're moving from one place to the other. The scripture doesn't say that Enoch sat with God. The scripture says that Enoch walked with God. He lived his life in this journey of faith, making progress, growing, learning, never being uh, content or complacent to settle for less than best. He was always moving and going forward, growing in his faith. In his book entitled, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat, John Ortberg offers the following observation. He asked the question, do you know what the number one selling chair is in America? It is the lazy boy, not the risk boy, not the work boy. We as a culture want to immerse ourselves in comfort. The decision to grow always involves a choice between risk and comfort. German theologian Karl Barth said that the comfort of the soul is the siren call of our culture. But to walk with God, we need to remember the call of Christ who said you are to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. There's a final characteristic of walking with God on this path of communion, and that is that it involves people. While it's possible to have a personal walk with Christ, a personal relationship with Christ. It is not some mystical, spiritual, isolated experience. The Bible says that when you are saved by grace through faith, you're called out of darkness into his marvelous light, that he then places you into a body of believers that the scripture calls brothers and sisters in Christ. That when you walk with God, you are part of a bigger family. That God intends you now to live your life in such a way that it is connected to other people. You may recall when Jesus was presented with the question, what is the greatest commandment? In other words, how does one honor God and live a life that's pleasing to God? The rich young ruler wasn't necessarily looking for Jesus to rank all the commands. He just wanted to know how does a how does one live their life in such a way to honor the Lord? And Jesus said that you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said the second commandment is likened to it, that you love others as yourself. Condense that. To how do you walk with God? You walk with God when you love God and love others. The Bible describes Enoch with just a few words. We don't know a lot about his life except that he was a man who was a father who walked with God. Now, we shouldn't limit family just to biological relationships because God places us in the body of Christ and gives us the opportunity to express love and grace to others. In fact, in John chapter 13, as Jesus has those final moments with the disciples, he told them, the love that you demonstrate toward each other will be a testimony to the world of my love for you. John, writing about that experience years later in the, his epistle that bears his name, 1 John, he would say, if we say we love God, but we have hatred in our heart towards other people, then we're a liar and the love of God is not in us. In other words, he was saying when you walk with God, when you love God, it is manifested and demonstrated by loving others. For Enoch, it was primarily demonstrated in his love for his family. How do you know Enoch walked with God? Because he loved his children. He led his children. He was an example to his children. 
When it says that he walked with God, it wasn't that he just went up on some mountain and got alone in a cave and was isolated from everybody. He understood that the call of God upon his life was to demonstrate the love of God to his family. We've seen the point of conversion and this path of communion as he walks with God, but I also want you to notice the proclamation to consider. The final reference to Enoch is found in the book of Jude with just two verses. Verses 14 and 15. And it says that Enoch, the second from Adam, prophesied about them. See the Lord's coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of the ungodly acts they have committed and their ungodliness and all the defiant words and ungodly sinners have spoken against them. It's a startling revelation that Enoch, from the book of Genesis, is prophesying about the return of Christ. And what he says about that is that the Lord Jesus is coming to execute his judgment. I like the way it reads in the King James Bible. It says that the Lord is coming to execute his judgment. Writing about the passage, Dr. James Merritt said in the book of Jude, we're told that Enoch gave a powerful witness for God. He was not a matchless patriarch like Abraham, not a majestic prophet like Isaiah, not a magnetic personality like Moses, not a master politician like Joseph, but he was a mighty preacher of the second coming of Christ, the first man recorded in Scripture to predict the second coming of Christ. Specifically, the Scripture says that Jude says that Enoch preached that Jesus would execute his judgment to convict the world. Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. The word convict is a legal term used in a courtroom. It speaks of a just verdict, a just sentence determined by an authoritative judge. Every guilty sinner will be confronted, convicted, and condemned without argument. For the ungodly, Jesus is both the prosecuting attorney and the presiding judge. At the trial, there will be no judge There will be a judge, but no jury. There will be a prosecutor, but no defense. There will be a sentence, but no appeal. In the entire biblical record, the only message that we are told that Enoch shared was, the Lord is coming back. He will execute his judgment. You need to be ready. We don't have any record of any other sermon that he ever preached. There are no writings that bear his name. We don't know his political tendencies and which kings he supported. We don't know how many cattle or camels that he owned. But he warned people about the coming judgment of God. It's highly unlikely that Enoch understood all of the details of the second coming of Christ. He probably did not know the secession of kingdoms and nations that are identified in the prophecy of Daniel. I doubt he understood the signs of the times that Jesus declares in Matthew 25 when Jesus said these are the signs of the times and when you see these things happening like birth pains increasing with frequency and intensity, know that the Lord is about to return. I'm pretty sure that Enoch did not know all of the details of John's prophecy recorded in Revelation about the bowls and the trumpets and the seals and the dragon. But he did know this. One day, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That he is coming back and every person must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And they will be judged for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And if they are judged according to a sinner, they will be cast into a lake of fire and eternal hell. But if they have received the grace of God, their sin will be forgiven. They will be declared righteous by the blood of Christ. And they will enter into a heavenly home in glory forever. And Enoch told people about it. He warned people that you will not live forever. And he lived a long time, 365 years. But he told people, you're not going to live forever. One day you will die, and you will have to face the judgment of God. You should be ready. Genesis chapter 5 has been called the desert of death. 
We didn't read the entire chapter, but had we read the entire chapter of Genesis chapter 5, you would find the phrase, and he died, used over and over. In verse 5, it says, and he died. In verse 8, and he died. Genesis 5, 11, and he died. Verse 14, and he died. Verse 17, and he died. Verse 20, and he died. Verse 27, and he died. Verse 31, and he died. My former pastor and friend, Frank Cox, tells the following story. He said there was a lady in, in his church, faithful member, whose husband did not attend church. And every Sunday she would ask him, honey, you want to go to church? And he always declined. Sunday after Sunday, year after year. And then one Sunday, just kind of unexpectedly, she was getting dressed, said, you want to go to church? He said, yeah, I'll go with you. She said she could hardly breathe. She was stunned, but she was so excited. They came to church, but said when they arrived and sat down in the pew and she took out her bulletin. I don't know if you guys remember what bulletins were, you know. A long time ago, we used to use bulletins. My daughter told me this past week that my granddaughter told her little brother, my granddaughter's four, her little brother's two. She said, call you a long time ago when I was a little girl. We used to go to a Mexican restaurant after church. <laughs> Seems like a long time when we did some of those things. But a long time ago when they had bulletins, this lady brought her husband. They're sitting in the pew, and she looks at the bulletin and sees Genesis 5 is the sermon text. And she begins to think, oh. Of all the days, the one time my husband's going to come to church, the preacher's going to preach some boring sermon from Genesis. Why couldn't he just preach something out of the New Testament like the Sermon on the Mount or on the miracles of Jesus? Or couldn't he talk about some of the, the wonderful parables and the stories that he told? But no, he's going to preach from Genesis. And just like she expected, the service was pretty uneventful. The invitation given, benediction, they left. And so she was surprised the next Sunday. He got dressed and decided he'd go again. This happened for five Sundays in a row. On the fifth Sunday, same kind of experience. She comes in, looks at the bulletin, and it happens to be like Mission Sunday or Tithe Sunday. And she's like, oh, great. Preacher's going to preach on money. What in the world? You know, my husband's never going to get saved. But the invitation was given. He was the first one out of the pew, walked the aisle, tears running down his face, and he gave his life to Christ wife asked her husband on the way home, honey, what was it about today's sermon that caused you to recognize your need for Christ? And he said, oh, it had nothing to do with today. I knew I needed to be saved the first Sunday I attended. She said, really? Well, what do you mean? He said, do you remember when he, the preacher, began to read about the descendants of Adam, and he kept saying, and he died, and he died and he died it was like something was cold water thrown in my face and I realized I'm gonna die one day and I'm not ready to stand before God Enoch walked with God and he warned people one day you will die if the Lord Jesus doesn't return in all of his glory and the trump sound and we're called up to meet with him in the air but if you take your last breath on this earth, you will stand before a holy God and he will execute his judgment from which there is no escape except the grace of God. The writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? The answer to the question is you will not escape if you neglect the salvation that is offered through Christ. The Bible says that if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. The Bible says we were enemies of God, but as many as received Christ, to them he gave the right to become a child of God. You will not be judged as a sinner, as an ungodly, pagan, rebel against God. You will be judged as a child of the Most High God whose sin has been forgiven and you have received the righteousness of God and you will enter into that glorious rest where Jesus said he's gone to prepare a place for those who believe in him. 
And perhaps the most quoted verse in all the world, John 3, 16, Jesus said it this way, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe in Christ, you will not perish. If you reject that salvation, you will experience the prophecy and the prediction of Enoch that you will be judged according to your sin and condemned. On this Father's Day, I ask everyone here, and particularly the fathers, can you say with confidence and assurance that you are ready to face that eternal judgment? If not, would you be saved today? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we come to a time of response. With heads bowed and eyes closed, just in a spirit of reverence, would you prayerfully consider the issue if you are ready to spend an eternity with God? Has there been a time, like Enoch's life, when by grace through faith you repented of sins and began to live for God. If not, the Scripture says you can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. The Scripture says that if you will receive Christ, you become a child of God. The Word of God says that if you believe in Jesus, you will not perish, but receive everlasting life. Would you call upon the Lord right now, right where you're seated? Would you pray something like this? Dear God, in the name of Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead. Today, Lord, by grace, through faith, I repent of my sin and place my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen. I'm going to ask you to look this way if you prayed that prayer today and trusted Christ to be your Lord and Savior. We want to have a record of that. We'd ask you to stay around. We're not going to do a formal invitation where we ask you to walk an aisle, but we want to know about the decision that you've made, talk to you about baptism. Those of you that are watching online, would you send us an email, contact us, call us at the church office, give us the opportunity to follow up with you, to give you the resources that you need to continue to grow in your faith. May we follow the example of Enoch and walk with God. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. May God be gracious to you and cause his face to shine upon you. You may be dismissed.